Hello, UCSB Physics Discord. It is your co-founder, Kyle. I'm here with the legendary Dr. B here. Uh, we're going to give an interview and we're going to take questions from you. So as usual, get in the chat and start asking those questions. We can basically have this as a conversation between you and Dr. B and I'm just the mediator. But I'm going to start off with a couple of questions on my own. Um, Dr. B, nice to meet you. Thank you for coming. Nice to meet you. Okay. It's really honors to be here. Yes, thank you. Um, what made you uh, interested in our Discord in the first place? I noticed you were the ones who joined uh, without an invite. Uh, where did you hear about us? I heard from students about Discord. I had perception that this is just students to students uh, space and was never trying to approach it and, and until I heard that actually the faculty also could participate. And um, I generally like to be aware about all aspects of physics department's life in classrooms and beyond classrooms. And um, I didn't have any other spe special intent just to know all parts of our body. Okay. Um, I understand that you do mostly teaching at this uh, the university and not do that much research. What made what motivated that decision to go into teaching? That's really interesting and old story. And goes back. It might take two three minutes to answer your. That's question. fine. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, originally, I always loved teaching, and uh, surprisingly, I felt it in uh, elementary school when I had a middle schooler uh, talking to us and teaching us something once after class. And I decided when I will grow up to middle school, I will also go back to elementary and will do something. Mm -hmm. And I went to my elementary teacher. She allowed me to see students once a week and promoted astronomy club. So astronomy. I have no clue what middle school or me was doing with elementary schoolers about astronomy, but we were all excited. And that's old story where it originated. And uh, later, uh, as soon as I graduated from Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology and went back to Georgia for PhD study, Georgia is country Georgia, true Georgia, okay. I call it, yeah. I uh, was not uh, supposed to teach uh, in Soviet Union, it's, uh, research institutions and teaching institutions were completely separated. I was doing my research in theoretical physics, but I decided to teach and uh, university really disappointed me. Uh, Georgian students were basically going in Moscow because the U Soviet Union was designed centric way. And I went to my school and asked a principal to give me one class and that was school for selected students, selected mm -hmm. who passed certain physics and math tests. And that was amazing thing. And later, a couple of years uh, later, some of my students dragged me in competition called Young Physicist Tournament. Mm. That is debate based competition. I told them I hate physics related debate because it smells like humanity, but they asked me questions and my principal always answers students questions. And they completely changed my mind. Three months later, I was coach of the team. And when we won Georgian competition, we went to the international and won that one. And that oh, was wow. interesting start of this international competition career that continued with physics Olympiad. And so passion of teaching was so strong that when economics started crashing and I had to select a mm -hmm. uh, uh, job with no pay uh, in research and job with little but pay in teaching, I had no regret that I pursued teaching and uh, loved doing that and still in touch with students from my first graduated class, particularly one of them is currently a full professor um, in the uh, University of Pennsylvania, and we still are in touch. <laughs> now it feels like we're of the same age, but it's okay. <laughs> wow, that's, a, that's quite a story. So it started way back in your home country that, um, and it was just, it wasn't, it wasn't really entirely in your control because you mentioned you had to choose a job between uh, no, no pay in research and then some pay with teaching. Um, if you could get a paid research job now, would you do the switch or do you want it? Or would you just stay teaching? You know, I now I know about teaching so much uh, that uh, I really love it. And I think that uh, I can proudly say that there are some success stories in teaching. And uh, uh, 
going back in research now is like going back to Olymp Olympiads to sportsman who is in my age, which is already maybe slightly late, but uh, I have no regret. I love teaching and advising. Advising is another component of what I do uh, in the department and in CCS. And I, I, I'm totally thrilled. It's really interesting, creative, and not less uh, adrenaline generating job than research. Okay, we have a question from the chat, from the Twitch chat from uh, Comrade Decky. Sorry, guys, if I can't read your name, it's kind of small on my screen. Um, Comrade Decky asks, if the Soviet Union weren't disintegrating, how do you imagine your life would be like now? Interesting question. Uh, it's really difficult to imagine because Soviet Union was gradually going to disintegration. And at that point where it disintegrated, it, it, the life was completely, I mean, collapsing. Uh, I don't know if you can believe or not, but in order to buy butter or bread, I had to use certain cards with, li with limited amount of food I could get. And that's one of the richest agricultural countries that uh, if economics is based properly, it would be the richest country fairing everybody around, but the system was so bad that it collapsed. So maybe I could see myself in prison, maybe uh, in the grave. I don't know exactly, but that would not be a happy story. Oh, okay. Um, so this is a question that a lot of people, including the seniors, really want to know. Uh, what paths other than academia have you seen uh, taken by people, other people in your career? What paths outside, let's say, um, outside teaching, outside research? Uh, many students uh, move in industry, which is, uh, I would say, a pretty big avenue, and it's avenue of success. One of my top beloved success story is a student who was my student in Georgia. Later, he graduated from UC Berkeley, uh, and later he hosted a couple of UCSB students in the, his research group in Los Alamos as he was postdoc in that group. And later, he decided that uh, it's time to move on. And he selected uh, uh, um, industrial position in amazing company where all of employees are physics PhDs. So they understand each other. They have same kind of humor. Moreover, the president so loves physics that he said that if you guys have any idea based on your recently accomplished projects and won't publish it, you have one business day in a week that you could completely dedicate to completion of your ideas. Wow. So that's the most amazing story. That's one of my top students ever. And uh, I think his career got new quality. And uh, I have students who work on Wall Street. I connected them to some of my current uh, UCSB students who want to explore that avenue. Um, I think that... Uh, I totally understand people who satisfy their curiosity in physics and decided that uh, it's time to move on and they look at this as natural next step. Love it, support it all the time. Um, there's a lot of uh, students on this discord and I guess in the department in general who believe that the PhD is everything, being a professor is everything. Like I'm. I'm pretty sure there's a bias towards being a P, going to a PhD, going to grad student, and um, becoming a, maybe a professor. Uh, what can you say to those students to help maybe change their minds or to like open their eyes to tell them, you know, there are other paths available? This is really interesting question. Apparently, I don't want to change their mind. I want them to change their mind themselves. And let me give you a clue. Uh, each time when incoming uh, ambitious, uh, academically ambitious student uh, plans things, I always tell them, plan that you are in physics major, plan you going in grad school in PhD program, plan you are doing top level research all the time until you figure out that you got taste to something else. Uh, I have an easy explanation for that. Being physics major, you expose yourself to one of strongest uh, major that uh, brain makes your brain sharp and you make decisions with no compromise like in, le in more vague subjects. Physics is pretty unforgiving to anything false. So therefore you keep your brain on top uh, uh, pretty much 
pressure is not good for on, on, on top performance. But I always talk to students about lots of career choices without pushing them there, but to make sure that their universe is wider than just physics major. And I see students who deviate in humanity sometimes and going to continue career that way. I had a student who just became movie maker. I have a student who went in music school. I have students who quit during the PhD program. One of my students dreamed for four years in CCS was Stanford. He got in Stanford. A year later, he got a job offer from SpaceX and he quit uh, pretty much academic career and moved in SpaceX, one of most exciting <laughs> projects we could dream about. Mm -hmm. so, I think that before you know exactly what is your career path, keep getting the top notch education. Uh, every year you become more, your brain becomes more and more amazing. So that's not a bad uh, a thing to have as a goal. Plus exploration of uh, other career options. Okay, thank you. Um, so if I understand correctly, you're teaching four classes this quarter. Um, INT 184AH, um, Physics 104, um, Physics 98, Physics 98, and Physics 36. And sorry, say that again. Physics CS 36. CS 36, yes. Yeah. Um, how does it feel to be teaching four classes remotely right now? Uh, I have no allergy to remote teaching. I miss uh, in person teaching, so therefore, as soon as summer session offered uh, in-person class, I signed up and today in the morning, right before our interview, I got approval for that class. The class is about physics majoring for sophomores who never stepped their foot on campus. So, so they have this opportunity to take in-person class with me in session B. I also know that uh, uh, Sivar and Aryan, two uh, current juniors in physics department, they won't help me teaching that class. These are two amazing young men. They uh, help me right now teaching, uh, actually they teaching 98 under my kind of super oh. supervision. And they will help me to teach uh, this summer uh, seminar for uh, sophomores who wants to finally see campus and get orientation about physics major right on campus. So uh, Zoom gives some advantages and I will take some of those in my future. Even in face-to-face -face classes, I think I will host office hours on Zoom uh, because I remember my room full of students, the room capacity is three and there are five, six students with line outside of my office. Uh -huh. Not the best uh, setting for office hours. Um, also personal meetings, uh, why should we necessarily meet in my office? Why, why not meet on Zoom? That could be exotic time like 8 p.m., 9 p.m. It's really convenient. Uh, and uh -huh. I don't need to plan head-to-head -head meetings when my brain becomes tiring. I want to talk to the students on fresh. So Zoom gives lots of opportunity. Even in lecture, organizing equations, using highlighting on iPad. iPad gives more options than a chalkboard. Um, so I still miss in person. Uh, I miss the feeling of students listening and uh, sparks on their eyes. This is something that I miss and uh, keep waiting when it will be back. Okay. Sometimes students say nothing, but I see in their eyes exactly what they feel, what they think and what questions they have. Uh, so definitely I'm in, fa I'm in face uh, t teacher. I would say, but uh, I'm not depressed about Zoom and I do my best to give students not less experience that they will get otherwise. That's great. Thank you. Um, I've got several questions in the chat now. Um, DJ Compartment asked, do you miss your home country? Uh, I do. I do miss my home country, uh, specifically people who I uh, love. I meet some of them here. Uh, but uh, moving out of country that could not provide me with my intellectual aspirations was a serious decision. I still love Georgia. It's under big pressure from Russia, who holds 20% uh, of Georgian land currently. Uh, and, uh, but Georgia is in difficult political situation and uh, uh, doing physics is not the best uh, thing right now in the country.
but it's going to it's a, uh, on improvement and economic improvement but still under pressure and under war with Russia it's a slow war not open war right now uh, it, getting involved in that is really depressing mm, okay uh, comrade Decky asks what is your favorite class to teach dr. B what is the deal about comrades I don't know I, I don't know hold on I personally feel cold to wind on behind my back when I hear word comrade because under word comrade so many people were executed in Soviet. Oh, I think it's just his uh, username. His oh, okay, all right, okay. It's it's just his username. That's what he calls himself. I'm pretty sure he meant no offense, and that's just something that he can't. He's already second comrade, and I think G was going good. <laughs> <with comrade. laughs> yeah. No, it's nothing like that. All right, okay, yeah. Uh, I don't know if I have any favorite class. Favorite class is one when I have more questions from the students. And uh, it's, it's always, uh, I mean, I always love interaction with the students. I would also say that I love harmony of uh, top demanding classes and more general classes. For example, uh, teaching uh, introductory lower division class at the same time with one of uh, upper division classes like in fall I was uh, or that last quarter I was teaching uh, physics 21 previous quarter physics 119 it's really a healthy combination I could see myself uh, if I only teach uh, top upper div classes I might lose some sense of uh, speaking about physics on qualitative level another way around teaching only lower division classes uh, may, maybe uh, start missing uh, some uh, some kind of uh, more advanced, more rigorous. So I really love combination, but most important is uh, students. If students are active, curious, working hard, sometimes need help, love it. That's uh, what drives me. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Bang Kui Kui. How do you decide who gets into CCS? That's a good question. Someone called CCS uh, grad school for undergraduate students. I usually hate quotes and almost never use quotes, but that one is so far one of my favorite ever because it so precisely describes what it is. Uh, unlikely colleges where admission officers read your application and decide how many points you got based on number of AP classes and your involvement in everywhere and all clubs and being president of everything that gives you the best uh, uh, mark or best admission score. In CCS, faculty read students' uh, application. So people involved in CCS are two of us, Atya Gurushwami and myself, as well as those physics uh, colleagues who teach uh, CCS lab class, as well as a couple of colleagues who taught these classes in the past and keep themselves on physics committee. So we all vote, discuss. Actually, vote is a formal word. We actually discuss. We exchange our opinion. And uh, we also recruit students. We send invitation to uh, some top applicants to UCSB physics program. So it's a lot of work in terms of interaction, in terms of selection of students. Uh, and uh, I'm proud about my incoming freshman class in CCS. I uh, already know that from 12 students, we keep waiting for more responses. Uh, some of them uh, turned down uh, Columbia, UC Berkeley, UCLA, many other schools that uh, traditionally people think that maybe are uh, better schools, but as soon as they learn about UCSB and CCS more, uh, they decide that we open more opportunities than many schools that are counted as higher ranked schools. Mm. So, um... DJ compartment quickly asks, uh, is 115A in session B in person? I wish, but it's already planned as online uh, and some students uh, enrolled as online class. So it's beyond my control to make it in person. Uh, okay. But if students are on campus, they're welcome to contact me because we do some in-person teaching. I might have some uh, outdoor uh, event for 115A one or two twice, maybe meet talk. You know, Aristotle loved teaching outside, outdoors. Mm -hmm. So why not continue peripatetic tradition and <laughs> maybe do some outdoors walking, talking, learning, teaching? Um, 
another question. Bang Kui Kui asks, what is the highest indicator for success for a student in your view? Uh, highest indicator of success is progress. Uh, I had students who started with a really low grade, like C in my physics 20, and three years later, I had the same student in my 119A, and that student got A+. Plus. So success is the highest indicator. It doesn't matter what is your grade today. It matters how you keep uh, developing yourself. And uh, it's, sometimes it's really tough. If I got C, I might think I'm last idiot in the universe. But uh, I, uh, I am in favor of positive optimism, of reasonable optimism, which means that think about improvement, but in reasonable steps, not just, yeah, everything will be okay. No, think how to make everything okay. And I love helping students with that. And genetically, that makes me the most engaged when I see success stories. I love movies about success stories. I love see success stories. It's uh, uh, maybe some competition, even not related to physics. Uh, one of my favorite shows is Voice, when I see how a person who is absolutely unknown and is not aware if the, she or he is good and all of a sudden sees this, uh, uh, I mean, feedback in the show and on your eyes from week to week grows. That's really interesting. Mm. So um, I have another question. Can you tell us of experiences where students surprised you in a good way? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, there are big surprises, small surprises. One of biggest surprises comes to, from my first job at, uh, in the United States. It was a private school, Wildwood School in West Los Angeles, school where many Hollywood celebrities uh, send their kids. Uh, a really small one. And uh, I had a student, uh, uh, she always looked confused in my, in my class and uh, barely following uh, class flow. And one day all of a sudden she started asking good questions or homework one day turned around in something amazing. And I asked her what happened. She said, I broke with my boyfriend and he was phys good phys in physics. And so she started working herself and she discovered that she is more genius than her ex-boyfriend. Oh. <laughs> breaking with boyfriend. So that's double happy story. She broke with her boyfriend and she started flourishing. Isn't this amazing? Physics over boyfriend. Excellent. Absolutely. Ex yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Okay, um, question. Um, okay, that's not a question. Oh, hold on. We just got a. Okay, no, I'm sorry. There, we got some comments in the chat. People are saying that they're happy they got an F in your 103. I don't know why, though. Bon Kui Kui calling you out. Let, let, let me tell you once I was on a, a Regent Scholars meeting at, uh, when it was still in person life. And uh, one of students was rushing toward me. I see a person is approaching me, running with big smile, happy face, hugged me and said, oh, hi, you are my favorite professor in fall. I said, yeah, it's so good to see you. What did you get? He said, F. I said, and I'm still your favorite? <laughs> of course, it was such an interesting class. And I learned that physics is not right for me. I now am in my happy major. I'm doing amazingly well. And, Cannot forget that experience. I thought, gee, that's the best thing to hear. If a student does not hate me, maybe I really find some kind of path to students' hearts. He would look really, really uh, sincere in all his uh, words he said. I mean, that's very interesting. Yeah, I would have been scared to hear just like if I was a teacher and I heard a student got an F, I would have thought they'd be mad at me, but that's a great story. Um, a question from the chat. Uh, what should we do right now if most of the professors in my desired area of research in UCSB are, in leave, are at leave uh, at their station queuing and I can't find any of the grad students? Okay, uh, here is the thing. Uh, the number of undergrads is huge, much less than professors. Therefore, in undergrad, uh, selecting research not precisely in the area of your primarily interests is is okay. You could find a person even in uh, engineering, in material science, in chemical engineering, environmental science. 
because uh, you are lucky if you got exactly what you are interested in. However, undergrads should consider research as part of their experience necessary for a grad school. So if you do research that you know that that's not your future area of research, but it's like taking some classes like philosophy classes, humanity classes, that is not your future area of research, but it shapes you. So research experience shapes some habits, habits to, uh, to look for a solution for a problem that nobody knows how to solve it. Build your own setup, be reliable part of the lab, uh, be good colleague, ask questions, uh, be curious. Uh, you gain absolutely uh, unique experience that you cannot get in regular classes. Also, someone knows you as your supervisor and that person will write a letter of recommendation for you and that will prepare you for grad school. And then in grad school, make sure that you are in the right area. And grad schools do not expect you to continue research in the same subfield. Moreover, oh. some, yeah, moreover, some schools will actually invite you. Uh, why not go through three rotations? For instance, Stanford and Berkeley are on quarter quarter system. They will say, why not take three rotations over your first year when you will take lots of classes and also expose yourself to three different labs. And maybe last thing, I had an amazing TA in one of my classes. This person came with astrophysics background to UCSB. And since he was my TA, he decided to chat with me. I was first faculty he met. And he said, you know what? I don't have any intent to do astrophysics. And uh, I gave him some advice how to be strong, how to show himself by taking amazingly well classes. Half year later, he was in quantum information. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there is no correlation between astro and the, so you, you need research to learn skills and also to have strong letter of recommendation. So it's combination of skill building and uh, building one of import, most important components of grad application is a letter of recommendation from your research advisor. So uh, how many letters of recommendation do you recommend for students to have? Uh, some schools want three exactly. Some schools give you option three or four. I think that the healthiest way to plan your application, just have uniform, unless you know, oh, in that school, I really want four. All right, why not? And uh, from my perspective, the best combo is your research advisor. And I overall tell students that 50% of your entire grad application success is one piece of paper or electronic page. It's a letter from your research advisor. Uh, and uh, if you did several uh, research projects uh, under different professors, uh, submit both because if you show something valuable on your, your resume, which is not supported by letter of recommendation, uh, that will be red flag. They will either uh, neglect your application or will call people who you work with. So you better do it yourself. And uh, if you have room for more than one of your recent uh, instructors, so if you apply in the fall of senior, then one of your junior instructors who already graded you and not only knows you like a nice person, but also knows you from final grades that that uh, instructor of this professor issued to you. So uh, therefore that's the recommendation of good set of letters. So if I just wanna repeat what I heard because this is very important. You said some schools require three, maybe four letters of recommendation, but it's okay because the one that really matters is the one you get from your research advisor. That's the most important. You know, I always tell people, it's my opinion because there is actually no equation of success for grad school. Each grad admission is different. Uh, they, they are professors. You could imagine professors are pretty creative people and they create their own uh, values how they uh, admit people. Mm -hmm. So therefore everything what I say about grad application is uh, approximation. Start with that and then build your case and still nobody knows how it will develop. Okay. That's why the number of schools I offer, I recommend people to apply for, I call it 12-ish. Maybe 10 is uh, already getting scary uh, because of statistical reasons. And you won't diversify a set of schools with some dream schools, with some safe schools, and decent number of schools that you are most likely targeting. 
So from that perspective, you better have a good portfolio. Uh, going more than, let's say, 14, so C12 plus minus two is kind of uh, Gaussian oh, shape. There going we go. Far beyond 14 is, uh, I mean, why would you do that? Maybe just if you do the right selection of a slightly less, that's okay. But I had students who reasonably decided to apply for 18 schools just because they were not sure about uh, physics or applied physics or engineering, they wanted to keep this flexibility open until decision day. Okay. Um, generally, when you see people who go from physics into industry, does that happen during their undergraduate, when they graduate from undergraduate, or do they have to have a PhD first before going into industry? Uh, there is no hard rule for that. Most people complete undergrad education, However, I even had students who started uh, working in business before got uh, his uh, uh, degree, bachelor degree, and only after three years in the business, uh, the student uh, finalized something and got a degree. Uh, so people start working and uh, they build their name and uh, they might be successful even before that. I would strongly recommend at least uh, BS, maybe masters, but uh, many people, uh, some people deviate during grad school. Uh, you know, there is option if you are in PhD program and you already accomplished your master's requirement, you could actually uh, interrupt your study with master degree, which is, uh, uh, it's not good thing to pre-plan, but if your evolution, because they, it's kind of uh, not uh, satisfying academic uh, integrity standards, if you plan to do master's, apply for a PhD, then you misguided your school. But if your evolution brings you to such decision, everybody will respect this decision. Mm. So success is uh, unpredictable. If I know equation of success, tomorrow a million people will use it. Uh, next day, it will not be equation of success. It will become equation of failure. So oh. in this world is not physics. There are no laws. Uh, I mean, there are some laws, but some of them on the level of advice when to do what, they expire really quickly. As soon as many people follow these rules, the rules become less effective. Yeah. Uh, a question from Natalie in the Discord. Is it better to have multiple research letters or is it better to follow one project for multiple years? That is a really good question, but there is no uh, right answer to this question. Actually, there is right answer. Right answer is, whatever is organic for your personal development. Remember, if you apply to college, you know checklist that most of admission officers follow and you pretty much know what's, how to build your case to be in college. Uh, for grad school, uh, grad school admission uh, is under professors. Professors decide and guess what? Professors are really smart people. When they look at your case and they see that you pretty much followed someone's advice and got right set of check marks, they become bored. If they see your organic story, maybe it doesn't follow any previous patterns, but they see that you particularly did three different problems because that was organic for you, for your curiosity. But if they see that you did three problems because someone told you about that, it will be so clear because professors are smart, they will see immediately, you did mediocre work in all, you, get, you did it somehow in fast uh, pace. Why did you do that? Maybe to get three check marks, stupid, we don't like you. Uh, so oh. everything that is uh, contrived to impress people will fail for sure because professors are really smart. If they see your case as organic and good, no, of course there are some still some bottom line. If you have no research, maybe don't necessarily apply to top school in your subfield. Uh, you need to have at least uh, one research project. Uh, if you have publication, amazing. But if you participated in startup lab and your professor who just started building new lab is happy, this happiness might be expressed in such words that it's better than hundred publications. Okay, maybe better than one publication. Say one publication. Yeah, yeah. So um, I would say uh, that's why you better have advisor who you talk with who could give you feedback is if you are doing right things or wrong things. And the best advisor is one of your professors who you trust, go in office hours, 
maybe at one, once ask about appointments to talk more about your personal case, but uh, really uh, organic development is what professors value who read your case and everything that looks like well, that student tries to manipulate the application, it's such not interesting student. Why do I need that student in my lab? Because remember what is decision, grad school decision. Professor who reads your case measures you in their lab. And it's okay, no, not really, boom. <laughs> I don't want this. Oh student. my God, okay, sounds scary. It's not uh, scary, it's other way around. It means that the people with true passion some imperfections will be forgiven. If you are true passionate about what you do, if you are a dedicated person, you will get sympathy. If you are like business, not even business, I don't know what to call it, the name, like how to label it, but if you check marker, check, uh, checker, I don't know what to call it, person who puts check marks to the pre designed list, then you, what is your personality? Uh, All I see is a bunch of check, check marks that someone prepared for you. So who are you? I don't know. So people want to know who you are and maybe related advice in your personal statement for grad school. Don't write about Feynman. Everybody, I mean, not everybody, many people quote Feynman. Why would you, they know Feynman's quotes. They don't need it. Or don't say that my uh, father inspired me and that's so and then write about your father. It might be really an important story. And I said that because personally for me, my father was one who inspired me to do physics. But when you apply to grad school, more write about yourself. Mm, that's good advice, yes. Thank and you. I asked one of my friends who reads a bunch of applications, what is the most annoying in personal statement? And he said, when I see my father, my uncle, my someone inspired, I think, okay, let me put this on hold. Let me look in the rest of application. Because maybe there I will see who is that person. Because statement that is not about that person, good things that they don't throw your application. They just say, okay, let me ignore. This is immature, whatever, who cares? Let me see what this person actually did. What is resume? What is what people say about? So they do not eliminate you by that, but they really think or oh, childish, whatever. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. Um, we have a question from Wells. Let's see, it's a long question, so let me pull it up here. Um, what is the expected level of understanding in physics classes? Are we supposed to learn to use the equations and theorems only, or both use them and learn the derivation process, or need to be capable of deriving them independently? I really love this question. Uh, I, I made already the impression perhaps of person who hates Soviet Union and uh, this was country that literally killed lots of people and destroy uh, uh, people's lives and careers. But there is one thing that I really love about my education. I have lots of things that I love from my prior life, but one thing that I love about my education is that in all of my uh, core classes like uh, math and physics classes, I had two exams each semester. One exam was written test like we have here. One exam was oral exam. An oral exam was based on every single topic explained by the professor in lectures. And you go to the box, you pick up a ticket and ticket tells you derive something, whatever they taught you. Derive, derive. derive. Like your professor on the board. You sit at the desk, you can take your time, they give you paper and pen, you, you, you write that, and the whole physics department or math department is in the room, your IDs are in, piled up, someone random picks up the ID that is on top of the pile, uh, looks at the photo, finds you and goes to you. So um. you a random professor who will uh, maybe not comfortable, you know, there are some scary people and then scary person goes to the pile of IDs, the whole room is sitting and uh, pretty much waiting who is the victim. Uh, and, uh, and I think that this experience was absolutely important because uh, people who formally use expressions without deep understanding what they use, this knowledge does not uh, uh, sit uh, deep in their tissue in their blood. But if you know how this equation could be derived, then uh, 
you better understand sense, you are more flexible to use it in different situations. And I know that some of my colleagues in physics departments consistently include this kind of questions in their exams because they think that this is big value to be able to derive. Unfortunately, Zoom instruction completely eliminated this kind of questions because when people have notes and books uh, on their desks, asking to derive equation is <laughs> the easiest uh, thing students can just copy from notes. Mm -hmm. But yes, that, that's really important thing. There were some, uh, some other components in, in the question. Uh, solving problems, that's another thing. I had a student who approached me, I think it was physics students, uh, physics 20 student. A student said, you know what, I invest whatever, 12 hours each week in studying physics. And then I asked student, how do you invest time? I'm sitting in the lectures, I'm sitting in discussion session, I'm sitting in PSR, I'm sitting in review sessions. I said, okay, all your answers start with word sitting. Please tell me how many hours you just alone with paper and pencil. Um, and students start thinking, I said, maybe almost not, none, mm, maybe half hour or whatever, just after writing all these notes from sessions. And I told the student that uh, the only time uh, investment that counts is uh, your thinking on problems. Going in lecture, going in sessions is useful as preparation. Solving problems is actual investment. So only this time counts for your learning. If you count yourself, how much you invested in success. And do not expect another student told me, I worked three weeks before final and still didn't get A. And I told student, you know, if you feel improvement, three weeks is not enough. If you want to build your muscles, do you expect in three weeks of exercising, you build mm. beautiful muscles? Just keep doing that. Don't expect for immediate result. Okay. I can speak forever. Let me stop here to this question. Let's, yes. let's, uh, we have another question from Min. Um, what is the most interesting or funny story from your career? Funny story from teaching career. Uh, you know, the, the uh, funny, funny story. Funny story how I changed my mind. I don't know if it is that funny. Oh, well, a funny story about the girl, the, the girl who dumped her boyfriend for physics. I was thinking about that, but why should I repeat myself, right? Um, I, I'm failing to find that. I'm sure there are funny stories. I more like success stories. Okay. Those, I have hundreds and millions uh, of success stories. I love talking about that. Funny story, maybe funny story is not about me, about my professor. I had my beloved professor of, in calculus. It was proof-based calculus class. And this, we love this professor. And he was passionately ex explaining something. And all of a sudden there was a, a little step uh, in the, uh, next to the board and he fell on this step. Oh no. He said, gee, hopefully nothing happened to him. We see he is falling, keeps uh, teaching us. He's on the floor, keeps saying things that he gets up with this smile saying it's so such a shame and continues talking and going back to the board with empowered passion. We burst in laughing. Uh, it just was a super amazing story about beloved teacher who did not injure himself and okay, was passionate good. enough to continue teaching from that's the good. floor. That's yeah. good. All right, thank you. Um, I have a question from DJ Compartment. He says, or she's, I'm sorry, uh, I can't pursue your gender. They say, uh, I don't know why I'm pursuing physics, to be honest. Is it okay to just pursue it because I like it? I don't know what else to elaborate in my applications beyond that simple feeling. Okay, I would strongly recommend the student uh, to talk to faculty who they, they uh, trust, but uh, there is nothing bad in passion about physics. <laughs> If you are passionate about something evil, how to destroy work or doing something else, that's a serious issue. If you're passionate about physics and doing physics, uh, as I said in the beginning, this keeps your brain uh, under right uh, challenge. It keeps developing you. But if you don't see yourself in physics, but just enjoy physics right now, uh, you got to explore some avenues how to continue. 
But good thing is that if you do physics, you do some accompanying activities like learning how to code, uh, develop some skills that are widely in demand in uh, outside of physics then you are doing the right thing. So I will always tell people who don't know their future yet, what is their academic path or not academic. I always tell them until you decide it, keep a goal, a PhD physics program. As soon as you decide, start crafting your way that way. But uh, that goal keeps you under the best academic challenge, keeps developing you. And that's really good thing before you decide it. Okay, I have a question from me, actually, this is my question. Um, what advice do you have for transfer students who come into the UCSB program kind of basically two years late and they don't have much time to form relationships with professors, do re get research, stuff like that? Uh, what advice do you have for them to uh, get into grad school? Uh, this is a good question. Uh, first of all, we have some stellar professors with uh, uh, transfer experience. Uh, when I was doing a year-long set of events in Santa Barbara City College, uh, I invited multiple colleagues, including uh, Professor Henavi, who loves speaking about his transfer experience and he's a superstar in astrophysics, right? So maybe for transfer students to meet people with similar career will be helpful. Okay. Also, I just, yeah? What professor was that? The, the astro Professor Henavi. Professor Navi in astrophysics group. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, last week, I actually worked on Lagoon with one of students who recently, uh, who just transferred as soon as, he, as that student decided to go. He got in touch with me and I worked with him around Lagoon, giving some uh, advices. One of advices that helped many transfer students, if you can afford taking summer classes, maybe take one class in session A maybe one, another one or two in session B, that is really a helpful way to get in a UCSB standards uh -huh. in really soft fashion. Also try to talk to your instructor in that class uh, to learn as much as possible about the department, about standards, because some students don't realize that if they don't want gap year and they won't go in grad school, then a follow of senior, they apply to grad school, right? Mm -hmm. So therefore they need to start early uh, taking care on that. Uh, I have several amazing examples. One example just stands up in my head of student who took my uh, quantum mechanics class in summer. Uh, he came from community college from Bay Area and uh, he uh, now in Princeton in the, the PhD program he is absolutely amazing student who did really right transition starting early and exploring things. One more student from Santa Barbara City College. He is now uh, in Santa Cruz in uh, grad school uh, in astrophysics and Santa Cruz in astrophysics is amazing school. So these students, the students told me that he does better when he reads in advance. So before taking my 103 class, he already approached me asking what resources we use what is advice for him to read in, in, uh, b before doing that? So any kind of attention to your career early, not just wait and think until things happen. Maybe they will not happen. Maybe nobody will uh, grab you and say, you know what, you need to do this, this, and that. Maybe we'll, people will just teach you and you will have almost zero experience beyond classroom. But proactively in interact with faculty, send five email, maybe one or two will reply. Uh, take summer class, go in office hours, talk to your professors. Just start building your case. And if you come with the right set of uh, uh, lower diff classes, then you are not behind the game. If you do right things, uh, you might build a super stellar career, like a couple of examples I brought. Those are just two, but there are multiple examples That's of great. success. That's great. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, we have a question from Fraps here. Um, as physicists or engineers, some of us will inevitably be faced with a moral dilemma contribute, of contributing to possibly ethically questionable technology or technology that humanity wasn't ready for. I would love to know what you have to say about this. Yeah, I wish I know the answer to mm -hmm. the question, but uh, uh, the good thing is that when people keep, keep their dialogue, because if, if someone knows exact answer to the question, um, 
that person maybe is uh, is not sophisticated enough. Uh, look, Einstein was the most pacifistic, uh, ultra left kind of uh, person, and he wrote a letter to FDR that pretty much uh, pushed Manhattan Project. Uh, so, I mean, uh, see the. the he will never have idea of developing any weapon unless we're facing some kind of severe catastrophe, right? That's one thing. The other thing is some people uh, do some kind of research in bio that they, some think it is uh, moral, some it is not. Until it is finally decided in such a way that everybody agrees, the dialogue should continue because if some smart people doubt this, Maybe they have really good reason to doubt it. Only after only freaks doubt this idea, maybe it's already time to say, okay, that's maybe decided. But I, I see that sometimes people who strongly believe in something try to convince others how wrong they are. And even if smart people answer different opinion, they won't almost kill them. I mean, almost, uh, but... Uh, Something that destroyed my country is uh, absence of political discourse. As soon as people decided that this vision is dominating, everybody else goes in concentration camp. That destroyed uh, social discussion, and the country became pretty soon became really, uh, uh, really, uh, I mean, in what was bad, really country not livable. Uh, everything stopped in that country. Dialogue keeps us developing. True competition of ideas crystallizes the most brilliant ideas. As soon as maybe a really smart group of people start dominating, don't do this, don't do this, don't do that, that group of people will finally will be out of ideas. So dialogue is super important thing about any controversial issues. And until smart people are on both sides, this dialogue should continue uh, and uh, people will make some decisions. Okay. So there is, unfortunately, there is no equation. It's not physics. It's more complicated. It's it's social. It's ah uh, yes, super complicated area. Thank you. Thank you for answering that question. We have another one uh, from Paul K in the Discord. What is your favorite undergraduate level textbook? Undergraduate level textbook. You know, uh, it's interesting thing that I grew up uh, hating. Uh, textbooks because my professor's lectures were so much better uh, ah. and uh, but some of my professors wrote books ah. I still have some even when I teach my current class I have my physics professor and advisor this is general physics course the other professor's book was recently not recently was at one, one day translated into uh, English and I obviously purchased that book he was an amazing professor, uh, and uh, uh, those books I love because I know people who wrote these books. And um, uh, let me give you an even better answer. Uh, one of my funny, maybe, experience and uh, really, really uh, influential experience. Uh, when I studied quantum mechanics, they decided that our major book uh, for undergrad, the very first book, is that one. That was a uh, book by Landau and Lifshitz. Landau was founder of university where I was going. But I was reading this book and I could not grasp. It was my first ever quantum experience. And what saved my life, if I have it right here, uh, this book saved my life. Uh, I started reading Dirac and after two weeks of deep frustration with Landau and me writing a lot of notes, how bad is this way to teach uh, <laughs> new people quantum mechanics? Uh, and then finally, this book opened my eyes, what are basics of quantum mechanics, how it should be built. After that, I developed a strong opinion that you should have several textbooks on your desk when you study because as soon as you don't like how one book explains, you might even become angry. I don't know if you ever had this feeling. Mm -hmm. You read and you're just angry. Either you like hate that. yourself or person who wrote this book, something. Switch and it, it, new light comes in the room. So I would say my favorite is combination, right combination of books. 
when I teach, you should see my desk underneath. I have this pile of classical mechanics books because I teach 104 right now. Mm -hmm. uh, even for teaching, I don't know what, what is one best book. Okay, I have a question uh, about the uh, int one uh, int eighty four ah class that you're teaching. I yeah. understand it's a special relativity course for freshmen. How do you introduce uh, a topic as complicated as special relativity to people who may not have the math background needed to understand concepts like four velocity, four vectors, and um, uh, other mathematical stuff? How do you kind of like tone it down to? Uh -huh. Yeah. to make it freshman friendly. Yeah, interestingly, I do it as rigorous as possible because if you will speak about relativity in more uh, qualitative fashion, it will become the most confusing area because you ask people to believe in something, they have no clue why they should believe in that. So I uh, explain, I have, dedicated math lecture, just what is Minkowski space? Mm -hmm. What kind of linear transformations keep invariant uh, a certain parameter? Uh, so I separately built math uh, as easy as possible to stay rigorous. And, and actually it is possible. And uh, well now performing career, uh, performing curriculum reform, I'm part of the Committee on Curriculum Reform chaired by Omar Blaise. Oh. And, uh, and uh, we decided to make Physics 103 mandatory class. Today, it is not mandatory. And we increased tremendously special relativity. Maybe after this upper division component of curriculum reform will start, uh, I will stop teaching this class because it, will, it might become part of 103. I will see if there is still demand. But I really feel the gap of special relativity. Some of amazing colleges like Harvey Mudd College, they actually start general physics education with semester long uh, course of special relativity. You need something that makes people feel like, oh, I just grew up. So this course uh, could be one of those courses in generic learning relativity teaches you some aesthetics of physics of 20th century because idea of Lorentz invariance uh, became, I would say, religion of theoretical physics. If word religion applies to physics, uh, we believe that uh, things should be relativistic invariant and should have uh, potential to be written using index notations in relativistic fashion. Sorry, a little bit deviated, but your question about relativity made me think about other uh, components okay. of background. It's okay, yeah, no. Um... I think we'll have our last question from Sarah Alex. Uh, Sarah Alex, uh, she asked, if you really struggled uh, your first two years, first year or first two years of undergraduate, but have improved a lot, how likely is that to hurt you in applications? How can we convince applications to pay less attention to those years? No, first of all, uh, for many people, success story plays really important role. If you are keep jumping up and down, that's not success story. If you had not amazing uh, records in lower diff and it gradually and consistently improved, I could see uh, many people who read your application and actually value you more than a uh, person with always straight records because you might be a more interesting person. If you show long term of consistent improvement, and uh, you properly write about this in your personal statement instead for quoting Feynman or Dirac, then uh, uh, you might uh, explain your case. Once again, remember, not admission officers, but professors read your case. These people are smart. You cannot uh, perform for them. Your application is not a theatric per performance. Your application is exposing your story uh, to really smart people who have really good basis of judgment. Some people will appear to not appreciate your case, but some will. And uh, that's why the number of schools you apply should be sufficient to take these statistical deviations into account. Mm -hmm. And definitely to the student, talk to a faculty who you trust uh, about some details to get some advice. Mm -hmm. I have lots of people who do that. This year I wrote 50 students, uh, rec letters. Wow. 
you multiply this by 12 ish and you will see how many uploads I made. And each wow. upload is related to checkbox marking and uh, signing my name. If student forgot to type my address, I do all that. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, a <laughs> that's a lot you do for them. Um, we have one, I think we I have, if you don't mind stay, staying like a I don't couple. Mind. I love it. A few more minutes. Okay. David Buya asks, how has the pandemic changed how CCS students are, CCS admits students? Um, honestly, um, yes, of course, once it's not pandemic, actually. No, I don't think pandemic changed it. Uh, thankfully, we still have AP tests. You know that UC system decided to go away from SAT, so we lost a lot of predictors about student success. But there are still school transcript and uh, thankfully AP scores. Uh, I don't think that the, just this year many things changed in CCS, but pandemic particularly, <laughs> it was the least factor, hmm. surprisingly. What factors did change CCS? No, we have new leadership in CCS, new approaches. Uh, SAT is out of the game. That also is uh, changed. So, Everything, everything like that, when it changes in small college like CCS is, uh, of course, uh, it's like wind blows on little insect or on, or big uh, truck. Uh, yeah, we're small, so any little changes affect us. But I don't know, I cannot say one particular, uh, yeah, we adjusted, but uh, yeah, we still, we, we, we admitted amazing class. My next freshman CCS advisory is absolutely amazing. Okay. Um, a question from Ilo in the physics discord. Uh, what's the main difference between Russian European curriculum and the curriculum in the United States? There are multiple differences and each uh, fits the other. For example, you know, book by Purcell, which is electromagnetism that we use in physics 24 and 23 and 24. As when that book was published, it was translated in Russian all next year because people immediately figure out how impactful is that textbook. And even in such ambitious place like Russia, when the Russians think that they did everything and other countries contributed nothing in physics or whatever the crazy ideas of dictatorship country, even in that country in my university, Purcell was number two. Wow. recommended a uh, book to read. Systems are different. I already told you about taking exams in two always fashions, oral exam and written test. Um, Soviet Union was not flexible about schedules. If you are a sophomore, you know exactly what classes you take and shut up. So uh, I had the only humanity class in freshman year history of communistic party, second year economics of communism, third year philosophy of Marxism, fourth year scientific communism. That's all my humanity education. I'm oh. so jealous when I see how my students select amazing humanity classes. I would go back to school and just take those humanity classes because that's something I really miss in my education. Some of my students who did study abroad in Europe, they were surprised how a uh, big uh, part of the grade comes from the final. Uh, one of my students said, oh, I didn't really get great. I was expecting for, I underestimated the uh, significance of final. And also that university actually treats that failing class couple of times is good thing. So you need to keep taking same class. Wow. Several times until you feel success. I mean, if they have this mindset that they easily fail you, they don't know that you then go back in United States and bring this bad grade on your transcript. Yeah. Oh, that's rough. Yeah. You know, drop it. Yeah. So there are multiple differences. But uh, what I'm really, uh, as I moved from ex Soviet Union and later Georgia in the United States, I see that many Americans think that the Russian system of education is good and they're critical about American system of education. For me, it is super laughable because American educational system is amazingly strong. Russian is not even made it close to that. Uh, Russian university number one could be maybe compared with number 100 in the United States. University number three maybe is like community college here. So uh, obviously such big country with big uh, 
cultural history, even in those uh, universities that they have, may, there are some superstars. You know, superstars could grow anywhere if person uh, is uh, smart and exposed to some resources. They grew up, but as the system, the system is really poor. It's pretty wasteless. Uh, oh. Maybe one more example of this kind of system versus American. Why Russia has amazing ballet? Uh, because each year, thousands and thousands uh, young people in, go in those ballet schools. Uh, instructors will take only those who have potential to become prima ballerina or prima dancer in top theaters. Eventually, out of this pyramid, only one or two people in each generation makes a good name. The rest are considered by the country as trash. These people have no future, no career. So that's how the system in ex-Soviet Union was built. Just on some uh, brilliant sportsmen, so therefore you could see some sport teams, but no massive sport. If you are not potential Olympic winner, uh, I was rejected from sports section because they didn't see in me potential uh, sport uh, Olympic winner. So um, this is how uh, pretty much they ignore uh, mass and just uh, target super success. So they have absolutely amazing couple of scientists, much less than today. Santa Barbara University has more Nobel laureates than Russia entirely. Wow. But if you talk to Russians, they will just look at you. Wow, we have superiors. Who are you? Uh, yeah. Let's not make this last question because uh, it's depressing. Sorry, I was. It's okay. Two okay. bad things, but that's what I feel inside, and honestly, share by feeling. Let me let me see. Um, Personally, as uh, how do you manage the work-life balance of uh, academic position at UC Santa Barbara? Like, I'm interested in being uh, an academic, but I'm not sure if I have good time management skills. So how do you manage your time and find a good work-life balance uh, uh, as a professor at UCSB? Yeah, I try to keep myself... Uh... Uh, busy because my time management is also not necessarily the most superior. Therefore, I use a lot of technology, like everything what I do is on Google Calendar, otherwise I will miss something. Uh, I have lots of events that I'm truly interested in, and those events pretty much define phase of my life. If on weekend we can travel somewhere, we travel, but pandemic uh, pretty much changed it. Right now my wife and I love working on Lagoon, uh, and that's... Uh, Really inspirational watching nature. And when you see the same birds every day, you start understanding something about their nature, how they behave, and when what is happy day for this bird and what is not happy. It is really uh, interesting to expose yourself to something not related or travel. Travel, I love traveling. Travel, tra car trips with, with car trip to Canada. Oh. No pre-planned, stop wherever we wish, go next day wherever we wish, eventually got to British Columbia. And oh, then wow. back. Yeah, th this is amazing when you feel freedom in even during the trip. Oh, wow, that sounds amazing. amazing. Well, well, Dr. B, thank you so much for coming to our interview. I know we've got a lot of people, 21 people were watching us. So that was, uh, that is uh, quite an audience. And um, Thank you very much. And thank you for joining our Discord. And hopefully we get to talk to you again sometime soon. I'll be happy. OK. All right, guys. Thank you very much for asking the wonderful questions. Um, as always, uh, hit that like and subscribe button. No, nah, I'm kidding. You don't have to. We'll post the announcements on Discord. This joke is getting old. I promise this is the last time I'm going to say that joke. Um, just anyway, uh, this is the end of the Dr. B interview. Look forward to our next AMA. It will be a text-based AMA. Probably we're going to try to get everybody on one topic to come and join. It might be quantum computing. It may not. We'll, we'll see. And until then, we'll have a nice day. Thank you very much, Dr. B. Thank you. I enjoyed this interview.